Okay. If you got your Bibles, go back to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter twenty-two. And if you're a little bit confused as we were reading that, you're going, what does this have to do with the family? Well, it's not about the family. We're taking a break from the series on the family uh, this time around. I just, um, I don't know, mentally I wasn't just really ready to preach it. And maybe the Lord put this other sermon on my heart anyway. So uh, Second uh, Chronicles chapter 22, Second Chronicles chapter 22, the title of the sermon tonight is From Joash to David. From Joash to David. And I'm, I'm not expecting that to make any sense to you right now. Okay, but as we get toward the end of the sermon, it's going to make a lot more sense to you. So we read about King Joash, okay? We read about one of the kings of Judah, and so if the title is called From Joash to David, we know that David was another king of Israel. So we're going to be looking at two kings of Israel, Joash and King David, okay? Now, uh, if you go to Second Chronicles uh, 22, Second Chronicles 22, because the Bible reading was from chapter 24, right? We're going to just do it a little bit of context to get us up to the chapter that was read. Look at 2 Chronicles 22 verse 1. So pay attention to all these names. A lot of names here. I want you to pay attention so you know what's going on in the story. Verse number 1. And the inhabitants, sorry, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his stead. For the band of men that came up with the Arabians to the camp had slain all the eldest, so Ahaziah, the son of Jeroham, king of Judah, reigned. Okay, so here we start the story of King Ahaziah, uh, the king of Jehoram, reigning in Judah. Okay, now verse number two, 40 and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. So he was 42 years old when he started to become the king of Judah. And he reigned one year, only one year, this king, in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Ataliah, the daughter of Omri. Okay, so this, this mother of his, Ataliah, is another important character that we're going to look at. Look at verse number three. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. So the house of Ahab was a, was a wicked king. He says he walks after that same king. And he says, for his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. Okay, so this new king... At the age of 40, or was it 42 years old, has his mother as his counselor. And his mother was a wicked woman, okay? Uh, At- At- Ataliah was a wicked woman, and she did wickedly, okay? Look at verse, drop down to verse number 10. V- drop down to verse number 10. Now, as we, before we read verse number 10, you need to understand the reason her son reigned such a short time is because he died in battle. Okay, well, he was injured in battle, then he was brought before some godly men, and they slew him. They killed him. Okay? And so we get to verse number 10. It says, But when Ataliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose, and look at this, look how wicked she was. She arose and destroyed all the seed royal of the house of Judah. So she goes around, her son's dead, and then those that would be next in the line to be king, she goes throughout the whole house, I'm talk- we're talking about her family members. We're talking about people that are, that are related to her. She goes around and kills them. She goes around and kills the royal seed. Okay? And as we'll soon see, she even tries to kill her own grandson. Okay? Because she does not want someone else to take the throne. The reason she does this is because she wants to be the ruler. She wants to be the queen of Judah. And she succeeds. For a period of time, she does become the queen of Judah. Look at verse number 11. But uh, Jehoshabiah, this is another important character, but Jehoshabiah, Jehoshabiah, the daughter of the king. Now, when it says the daughter of the king, it's not talking about uh, King um, ah- Ahaziah, but the king, uh, the, his father, his father. So she was actually the sister of King uh, Jehoshiah, okay? So the daughter of the king took Joash. Now, we read about Joash the king, okay? Here, when she takes Joash, she's about one year, one, one year old, okay? Took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons that were slain, and put him and his nurse in a bedchamber. So she takes baby Joash, because his grandmother's killing all the grandchildren, okay? How wicked! And she goes and tries to save this child. She takes Joash and gets him a nurse that can raise him, and uh, hides him in this bedchamber. So 
Jehoshabiah, the daughter of King Jehoram, Jehoram the wife of Je, Jehoiada, sorry, Jehoi, Jehoiada, Jehoiada, that's it, the wife of Jehoiada, the priest. So this other important information about this woman, yes, she's the sister of the king, but she's also the wife of this priest. Okay, this priest, uh, Jehoiada. And this priest is a very important character in the Bible. He's a, he's a real godly man. He's a real faithful man. And then it says in brackets, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from um, at, at, Ataliah so that she slew him not. So do you get the picture here? Auntie, what's her name? Auntie Jehoshabiah takes little baby Joash and hides him from his grandmother so she can't kill him. Okay? And takes him. Look at verse 12. Where does she take him? And he was with them, hid in the house of God six years, and Ataliah reigned over the land. So this little baby Joash is taken to the temple of God. He's raised with, with, uh, with a priest. He's raised with his uncle and his auntie and with this nurse that's helping him grow up. Okay. And while this happens, his grandmother rules the land, rules Judah for six years. So it's about one year old when he gets taken. Six years later, he becomes seven years old. Okay. You're following the story so far. Okay. He's been raised by godly couple. He's being raised by his godly aunts and uncle who are protecting him from his wicked grandmother. Okay. Now we're not going to look at chapter 23. There's not enough time to go through all that. But chapter 23 basically uh, reinforces to us that this priest, Jehoiada, is truly a godly man. He truly risks his life. And at the age of seven, King Joash is crowned king. Okay. And uh, uh, this priest, Jeho Je Jehoiada, Make sure that the people of Judah are supportive of this new king, even at the age of seven, okay? And when the grandmother finds out, she hears all this celebration, he's being crowned as king. There's all this rejoicing and celebration. You can read it in your own time in chapter 23. She comes out to find out what's going on. What's all this sound? What's all this celebration? What's going on? And when she comes out, she sees that a little grandson is being crowned king at seven years old. You know, and she yells out, um, what does she yell out? I have to look. I won't find it now, but, um, you know, she's obviously very upset. And, uh, what happens is Jehoiada, this priest, commands, uh, some, some men to go and, and take her away and slay her. And she's put to death. Okay. So we see this priest, you know, risks his life for, for his nephew. Okay. Protecting him from his grandmother and then crowns him, crowns him king when he's age seven. So we pick up the story here. In 2 Chronicles 24, the chapter that was read, let's look at verse number 1 again. It says, Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. Okay, The big difference between a wicked king who reigned for one year, he did not have the blessings of God, and then we have this little child because he was raised by godly, well, it wasn't his parents, but aunt and uncle, and he was able to reign for 40 years in Jerusalem. Okay? His mother's name also was Zibia of Bisheba. Now look at verse number two. It's very important that you understand the phrase that's used here in verse number two. It says, And Joash did which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. That's important for you to understand. Did he do right? Yes. Was he a godly king? Yes. Did he seek to please the Lord? Yes. And as we'll soon see, the Lord blesses his kingdom. Okay, but notice how it said all the days of Jehoiada, the priest. This is very important for you to understand because King Joash had a godly role model. Okay, he was faithfully serving the Lord so long that uh, Jehoiada was there helping him along. Okay, he had godly, he had a godly influence. Okay, and some of you, and this is normal when you get, when you're saved, and you start as a babe in Christ, when you're, when you just start out new, it's good to surround yourself with godly examples, with godly leaders. It's good to find a church that you can be around godly men that can help you in, in your growth, okay? Because you're more likely to do what's right while these people are around you, okay? And uh, so things start off really well. It starts off really well for King uh, Joash, you know, all the days of Jehoiada. Look at verse number three. And Jehoiada took uh, for him two wives. Now, obviously that was wrong, but he begat sons and daughters. 
And it came to pass after this that Joash, look at Joash, after this, Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. So what's, 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 what's set on his heart? He obviously loves the Lord. And now he wants to go and fix the temple. He wants to fix the house of the Lord. Because previously to that, his predecessors weren't worshipping God. They were worshipping false gods. They were worshipping idols. And so the house of the Lord was destroyed or you know, needed repairs and no one was looking after it. And he puts it in his heart, no, we need to fix this house of the Lord. Okay, We need to make sure that we're able to worship God in our full capacity as a nation. And then verse number 5. And he gathered together the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out unto the cities of Judah and gather all of all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year and see that ye hasten the matter. Howbeit the, the Levites hastened it not. Okay, so I'm not preaching on money today, but obviously in order to do things for the Lord, in order to look after uh, like a building like we have today, obviously there are finances that are needful. And so the king takes it upon himself to get the priests and the Levites together and says, look, we need to start a collection, get everybody to come and give up their offerings, give up their finances, give up their gold, so we can then repair the house of the Lord. This is a great task that has been undertaken under the reign of King Joash. Drop down to verse 12. Drop down to verse 12. And the king and Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord and hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord and also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. So you see that they're getting to work, they're getting, they're hiring the right people. Verse 13, so the workmen wrought and the work was perfected by them and they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. Not only did they repair it, they made it stronger. Okay, so that it would last longer, they strengthened it. Verse 14, and when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, whereof uh, were made vessels of the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister and to offer withal in spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered, finally, once it's all done, they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually. And notice the next phrase, all the days of Jehoiada. Okay, so they, they repair the temple. They, they get the altar established once again, and they start sacrificing, bringing offerings to the Lord once again, which was the right thing to do, okay? And, and they did so. You know, King Joash and, and Jehoiada, the priest, were a great team, okay? And you can see that they're doing it every day. You know, they're truly wanting to love and, and worship and serve the Lord, okay? King Joash, at this point in time, was a godly man. But notice that phrase again, all the days of Jehoiada. Why does God want us to, to tell us this? It's very important because Jehoiada was such an influence in Joash's life. And as I said, it's a good thing. It's a good thing for you to get around the right kind of people that will strengthen your faith, that will make you more godly, that will make you want to serve the Lord more. That's a good thing. But we're going to learn now what happens if, if, you, if you're not doing this right. Okay? Look at verse number 15. And Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. Full of days. Look how long he lived. 130 years old was when he died. I reckon the Lord probably lengthened his days because they were doing so well together uh, as, as priest and king. And then it says, verse 16, and they buried him. Look, at, look where they buried him. They buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel both toward God and toward his house. They said, look, we're not just going to give him the regular burial as a priest. He's done so much good for us, we're going to bury him with the kings. Okay, so you can see that, you know, the nation truly honored this faithful old priest. Okay, and then unfortunately things changed. Look at verse 17. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, what's going to happen? This Before we read it, guys, if you have godly influences, godly leaders, godly examples that you look up to, there's going to come a time when they're not around anymore. Okay, this is going to happen to you. You're not going to have the godly influences all the time around in your life. Sooner or later, they're going to be gone and you need to stand on your own two feet. You need to stand on your faith. Okay, you need to stop relying on other people and be ready to take a stand alone for your faith, if that's what it takes. Unfortunately, Joash was not ready to stand alone. Look at verse 17. Now, after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah, and made obeisance to the king. And then the king hearkened unto them. So that word obeisance basically means to revere, 
to honor the king. And notice they waited after Jehoiada was dead. Okay? Because they knew with Jehoiada around, Joash would not listen to them. Okay? They came with bad practices. They came with bad requests. They came with wicked requests, in fact. Look at verse 18. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, 18. And they left the house. So once the king listens to them, hearkens to them, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Joash, what is wrong with you? You know, you've been brought up in a Christian home. You've seen the blessings of God. You've had the godly example of Jehoiada and all it takes is him for him to be gone and now you're listening to the wrong kind of people. You're listening to the wicked people. You can see that Joash was not faithful on his own. He was too dependent on others. By now, at this age, he should have been able to stand up on his own two feet. And he should have been able to tell these guys, no, we're going to continue serving the Lord the way we started. Look at the blessings that God has given us. Okay? And then they worship idols and the wrath of God falls upon them, doesn't it? Um, uh, verse 19. Let's have a look at this. And uh, yet, he, talking about God here, yet he sent prophets to them. So God just mercy, has mercy upon Joash, okay, because he's been a faithful servant to him. He brings prophets. He wants to correct him, okay? Does he listen to the prophets? No, he's going to listen to the bad advice. Uh, he brings prophets to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear, okay? And you need to make sure that whoever you give your ear to is someone that is godly. God may send prophets into your life, preachers into your life, teaching you the word of God. Those are the people you need to hear. And the devil will send his ministers, the devil will send his people to destroy your life. Okay? And even King Joash, who should know better, listen to the wrong kind of people. Okay? Verse 20. And the Spirit of God. So he wouldn't listen. Jo uh, King Joash would not listen to these prophets. So who does God send? And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, it's not the same Zechariah as the book of the Bible that you've got. It's another Zechariah. The son of Jehoiada, the priest. So he sends Jehoiada's son to the king. Okay? Now you would think he would listen to the son of his faithful friend. Okay? He may have even grown up with the son of Jehoiada. Okay? Uh, and then it says, Which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord? that ye cannot prosper, because ye have forsaken the Lord, he have also forsaken you. This is the judgment that's come upon King Joash and his kingdom. The Lord has forsaken them. Look at verse 21. And they conspired against him, against you know the son of uh, Jehoiada, and stoned him. They killed this prophet. Stoned him with stones. Who commanded this to happen? At the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. King Joash was the one responsible to have this prophet killed. The king, uh, sorry, the son, the son of the priest that he looked up to. Verse 22, Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness that Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. So he killed Zechariah, Jehoiada's son, after he, as a baby, was protected by Jehoiada. How wicked, how far back, how backslidden did he become? And why? Why? Because he could not stand on his faith alone. He could not do it. He was too dependent on other believers. He was too dependent on other people of God. Okay? And I, I hope there's always a New Life Baptist Church. I hope there's always someone godly that you can listen to and be encouraged and grow from, but there might come a time in your life when you don't have these godly influences, okay? And you can either take the root of King Joash and crumble and fail, okay, and destroy your life. It's possible, even as a believer. Okay, King Joash was definitely a saved man, definitely a believer, but took the counsel of the wrong kind of people and killed God's people instead, okay? This is uh, Joash. Now, let me say, again, there's nothing wrong. In fact, it's recommended that you get godly people around you that can encourage you, okay? But you must, at some point, be able to let go 
of their faith and, and, and stand strong on your own faith in the Lord. Okay? So we see how King Joash has failed. Now we're going to compare him to King David. Go to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. We're reading this off, you know, popular chapter in the Bible, the story of uh, David and Goliath. Okay? So this is before David was a king. But he's obviously on his road to become a king. So let's look at, let's look at David. And then we'll compare these two men. 1 Samuel 17 verse 1. 1 Samuel 17 verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at, uh, Sokoch, which belongeth to Judah and pitched between Sokoch and Azekar in Ephes Damon. I might get Jason to come up here and read for me. <laughs> and so and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. You guys know the story of Goliath, uh, the giant. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had gr- uh, greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood. So uh, this Goliath stands and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me, and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But I will prevail against him, and kill him. Then shall ye be our servants, and serve us. So you see what's going on there. Instead of the two armies going to battle, they send the most powerful warrior. Now, I don't know if he was the best warrior, maybe, or maybe it was just his, his height and, and his, how large he was that, that just scared you know the Israelites. And he says, look, instead of us all fighting, how about just me and, and, and one of your men? We go to battle. And if I beat him, you become our servants. Hey, if he beats me, we'll become your servants. Sounds pretty fair. Instead of there being bloodshed of hundreds of thousands of people, you know, let it be between two men. Sounds about right, okay? And then it says here, uh, verse number uh, 10. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Hey, these are the armies of King Saul. These are the armies of Israel. They have won many battles throughout their, throughout their time. You know, King Saul, he should be the leader. He probably should be the one going out against Goliath and fighting this, because back then, the kings, they weren't just people that sat on a throne. The kings were the leaders of the armies, Okay. And so you would think these battle-hardened warriors would not be afraid of the Philistine, especially when they've seen the hand of the Lord deliver them from their enemies time and time again, okay? But sometimes there will be a Goliath in our lives, and sometimes the people of God will be too afraid to fight Goliath, okay? You would think somebody from the army would fight him, okay? Look at, drop down to verse 20. And by the way, this goes on for 45 days. Verse 16 explains that to us. Uh, Goliath, day after day, day for 45 days, a month and a half, uh, uh, challenging them. Send me a man. Send me a man to fight with me. Okay? And you definitely see the army is afraid. Verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went. So David, a shepherd, he looks after sheep. He's never fought in a war. He's not a soldier. He's not been trained to fight with a sword and a spear, uh, sorry, and a shield, or maybe a spear as well, okay? But he gets up, uh, he, he leaves his sheep alone, and then he, as Jesse had commanded him, his father had commanded him, he's an obedient son, and he says, and he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. Verse 21, for Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. 
And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. So he had brothers that were in the war. He had brothers that were soldiers and he goes and salutes them. He comes and brings them uh, some cheese and some food to just help them, to replenish them. Okay? And then verse 23, And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according, according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they had saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. So the armies of Israel afraid of Goliath, sore afraid. They were so afraid of him. They were lacking faith, weren't they? They were lacking trust in the Lord. Verse 25, And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up? And it shall be that the man who killed him, uh, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Okay? So David here sees the fear uh, of these men of war, supposedly. Okay? And not only if they went to fight Goliath, not only would they win the battle, but they would be able to uh, receive as a wife the king's daughter. Okay? So they would be able to, and, and they'd have their family free in the land. Any debts, you know, that were owing to the family would be let go. That'd be, you know, a great blessing for anybody that could defeat Goliath. And then you take the, the daughter of the king, and so your name would be, you know, uh, lifted up, I guess, in society. Okay? And nobody wants to take him up on this offer. Verse 26. And David spake to the man, that's the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine, and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? David's like, who is this guy? You know? Who's he that thinks that he can defy the armies of the living God? How can he, how can this one man stand up against you? You're representing the God of the heavens. Okay? Uh, I love David. Okay? He's got no respect for Goliath. It doesn't matter how big this man is. Okay? It doesn't matter that all the armies of Israel were afraid of him. They was like, who is this guy? We should be able to take him on. You know, we're the armies of God after all. Verse 27. And the people answered after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And uh, Eliab, his eldest brother, so Eliab's a brother of David, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? David, what are you doing here? You know, you need to go back to the sheep in the wilderness. That's where your place belongs. Why are you here in the battlefield? Is basically what he's saying. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest, mightest see the battle. Now when you see a battle that needs to be fought, when you see that the people of God are not standing up for the word of God, they're not standing up against heresies, and they're not standing against wickedness, and if you decide, hey, this is not right, you know, and you start preparing yourself for the battle, you start thinking, hey, I need to be the one that fights this battle, guess who's going to come against you? For David, it was his own brother. It'd be your closest friends. It could be your brothers. It could be your own family that will stand against you when you start preparing to stand for the Lord. Okay? And you're going to be accused of being prideful. You're going to be accused, what else? Uh, that there's a naughtiness in your heart. They're going to accuse that you're wrong. And the reason they do this is not because they're, they're concerned about you fighting the battle. They do it because they don't want to fight the battle. And if you go out and you fight the battle, if you go out and stand in faith, and they're not standing in faith, it makes them look bad. It makes them look bad. So instead of them wanting to look bad, they would rather put you down, okay, and say, what are you doing here? This is not your fight, okay? And so we see the difference here with David. He is alone, okay? Like King Joash, who was alone but could not stand on his own feet, we see King David, or no, he's not King David yet, but we see David, he's able to stand on his own. Okay, he has a faith in God. He goes, what's this giant Goliath? Who cares? Okay, we're the armies of God. All right? Verse 32. And David, so he gets brought before King Saul, because nobody else wants to fight him. Okay? And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant, speaking of himself, will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, 
Thou art not able to, to go against the Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And so let me just say, first of all, for those that are young here, especially the children, okay, you can fight the battles that God has for you, okay? Don't let anybody uh, laugh at your youth, okay? Like David, you can stand for God, you can stand for the Word of God, okay? And uh, you don't need to worry about it because God wants to use young people. It's often the young people that have the greater faith in God anyway, all right? There's a reason why when we go out and knock doors, it's the younger people that are more willing to talk to you about the Bible, okay? Because they haven't been corrupted, okay? They haven't been uh, uh, laughed to scorn. They haven't really been hurt uh, by religious institutions or whatever. King David comes straight out of, the, out of, out of, um, out of uh, being a shepherd and now wants to enter into the battle. Now look how David answers King Saul. And this is the important part that I want you to really focus on. This is really the, the key to the message tonight, okay? And David said unto Saul, Thy servants kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out against him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servants slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he have defied the armies of the living God. You see, the reason David knew that he could fight Goliath and defeat him, the reason why he knew he could stand alone is because he had done it before. This isn't his first fight. Okay? He was a shepherd. He looked after sheep. Probably nobody even knew that his sheep would be sometimes attacked by a lion or by a bear. And yet when David saw his sheep being attacked, he went out and defended it, okay? He went out and he killed the lion and he kills the bear, okay? The point I'm trying to say to you right now, guys, is that in order for us to fight Goliath, in order for us to stand firm in our faith on the great battles, we first must fight the smaller ones, okay? Before we can take on Goliath, we need to take on the lion and the bear, okay? Before we can go and deliver an army of Israel, from the hands of the Philistines, we first must deliver the little sheep. Okay? God has set in our lives and in our, in our path the small battles to fight. We need to start fighting those small battles in our life. One at a time. And slowly, as you fight the battles and you get victory, your faith will be increased. Okay? To the point when you can face a Goliath and defeat him and know you can defeat him because you're strong in your faith. Okay? David was alone. But because of his past experience, because of his past victories, he knew he could win this battle. Okay? Very different to King Joash, who failed as soon as he had to stand on his own two feet. King Joash was too dependent on other men of God. Okay? He hadn't worked in his faith. He hadn't grown spiritually. But King David, we see slowly but surely, he, he uh, won victories in his life and got to the point where he is now. You know, if you want to be a Christian that wins the great battles, you must win the smaller battles, okay? Before you can fight the big battles, you have to fight the smaller ones, okay? Now, I'm not preaching on, on family, but still, you know, is your marriage the sweetest it's ever been? You know, and if it's not, that's a battle you need to win. You know, are your children the most obedient and the most respectful that they've ever been? If not, that's a battle you need to win. All right? Are you, are you reading your Bible every day? Have you read your Bible cover to cover? Are you continually praying to the Lord? You know, are you someone that can present the gospel to a, to a lost and dying person? You know, these are battles that you need to win. Okay? I'm just talking about the spiritual, uh, things. You know, how's your house? You know, what's your house's entertainment like? You know, is it filled with the world's music? Hey, if it's filled with the world's music, that's a battle that you need to win. Okay? If you're entertaining yourself with the, with the, you know, all the movies of the world and, and all the wickedness and all those kind of things, you know, what kind of books are you reading? You know, does it praise the Lord or does it blaspheme the Lord? Hey, these are battles in your life that you need to win first. If you want to be a man that can stand like King David and fight against Goliath, you need to take care of the little things first. Okay, you need to take care of the sheep. 
before you can take care of Goliath, before you can destroy Goliath, okay? And even us, guys, as a church, you know, yes, I want to be a church that wins great victories. Yes, I want to be a church that fights, you know, all, you know, all the false prophets here on the Sunshine Coast. Yes, I want to do that. Yes, I want to take on Goliath at some point, but at first, we need to fight the small battles. We need to make sure that we have the small victories first and build from that. Okay? As, as we approach our first year, we're not one year old yet, but we almost are. We're still young. We're still a young church. I'm personally still a young pastor. Okay? We need to make sure that the things we do in church, just the services, the soul winning, we need to make sure we're constantly doing those kinds of things. Okay? We need to make sure, just like sheep, that we're taking care of the sheep of God. Okay? Of, of the, of the, of, um, the, the sheephold of Jesus Christ. Okay? Doing that, just like King David was, before we can go and join the, the battle of the armies. Okay, we need to start and win the small battles first. Then we can do the greater things for God in due time. Okay, because if we as a church and we as families and we as individuals seek to fight Goliaths without having won the small battles, Goliath's going to mop us. Like it's just going to take us and wipe us out. Okay. And I, you know, any new church, and we are a new church, needs to make sure we take care of the basic things first. Let's do the basic things well. Let's do them right. Okay? And then surely, and I've said this before, organically, we're going to grow. Organically, we're going to fight the bigger battles. But all along that pathway, we're going to have our faith increased. Okay? And we're going to see the hand of the Lord uh, uh, take place. He's going to come and defeat our enemies for us. Okay, he's going to come and help us get the gospel out to this area on the Sunshine Coast. We need to make sure we take care of the small things first. Look at verse 37. Verse 37. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And David said unto, sorry, and Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with thee. So David goes and fights Goliath. Look at verse, drop down to verse 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thee flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Uh, these are some of my favorite words in the Bible. Verse 46. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the, is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So we see that as we, we take on the battles that God places in our lives, that we need to make sure we, we, we do them one at a time. You know, they increase slowly, they get greater, so we have to fight Goliath. But all that time, it's the Lord that does the delivering. It's not out of our own, our own strength. And that's why David was so strong, so strong in his faith, so strong in spirit, because he knew that the Lord was with him all the way. Okay? Uh, what am I up to? 48? Think 48. And it came to pass, when the Philistines arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, and David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face on the earth. So David prevailed against the Philistines with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw the champion was dead, they fled. Now it's verse 52 that I want you to focus on as well. So David has this massive victory. He stands on his own in the face of people mocking him. Okay, his own brother. In the face of King Saul saying, hey, you can't do this. You know, you've never fought a battle. You know, and still when he stands with the Lord, he's able to accomplish great things. Verse 52. 
And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come unto the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way uh, to Shariam, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. So we see these armies that were once afraid, they would not fight this battle. Once they see David have his victory, they stand up, they shout, they're, they're emboldened, they're filled with courage, and they go out and defeat the Philistines. They go out and, and make war. Okay? The point I want to say to you guys is that you need to go from being a Joash to a David. That needs to come a time when you stand on your own two feet, when you stand on your own faith, when you stand on the Lord and you're no longer dependent on other people to get you there. Okay? And there's going to come a time, and I, you know, when you do need to stand alone. You know, in the face of people mocking you, in the pe- face of people saying you can't do it, hey, if you stand and you win, hey, the same people that doubted you are going to be the same people that rise up and get encouraged. You know, the faith of one man goes a long way. Okay? But then it's also so hard to stand alone. Okay? We saw that with Joash. It was so hard for him to stand for the Lord when he started listening to the wrong kinds of people. When he no longer had the mentor in his life that he needed. Okay? So in conclusion, guys, in conclusion, it's fine to start as a Joash. It's fine to start that way. You know, partnering up with the, with men of God, there are blessings to be had. You know, surrounding yourself with the right kind of people. But there must come a time when you can stand alone in your faith. Okay? And I want you to just examine yourself. If you lost this church, if you lost, the, the, you know, influential people around you, you know, would you continue serving the Lord? You know, could you give the gospel out without any help? You know, doing the basic things. You know, will you continue reading your Bible and praying to the Lord if you don't have these influences around you? You know? It's going to be a test of character. That's truly when we know when someone's faithful and someone's mature is when they no longer have any help and they need to stand alone. Now, I don't want to stand alone. Obviously, it's much easier to stand with brethren that are like-minded, that are like faith, that are willing to fight the same battles, the same spiritual battles together. That's ideal, okay? But it could happen in your life when you need to be alone, okay? And uh, you can see that Joash was weak in the faith, uh, weak in the faith and departed from the Lord, and yet David was different. He was grounded. He was strong. He went from faith to faith, from strength to strength. He went from battle to battle. It got more complicated. It got more harder. But it was the same faith that he had in the Lord that got him through all those battles. Okay? So, and again, when he was alone and he stood up for God, then others, other believers were able to rally around him and be emboldened and be courageous. Hey, we need to go from being Joash's to David's. That's something we need to strive for in our lives. Okay? Let's pray.